It started in the crib. I was a baby, and uh, from the crib all the way to age 11, more or less, I had what is called lucid dreaming, which means that you dream that you are awake. Hola. So I literally saw monsters. I was used to monsters. I loved them. But, uh, you know, at a very early age, I made a deal with them to allow me to go to the bathroom because I was so afraid that I ended up peeing my crib. And, you know, we stayed friends. Soy un fauna. You know, there are only two things you can do in art or in narrative and storytelling. You can tell about the good stuff in life, which has always been very boring to me. And you can tell stories about the dark side of life, which has been much more attractive to me. Now let's talk about the notebook. Yeah. First of all, there's several of these notebooks. Yeah. And you're constantly carrying one of these around mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. at all times, right? And what's the purpose of it? I bought these uh, notebooks in a, a notebook maker shop in, in, in Venice. And then these are notes for Pan's Labyrinth, you know. Wow. Well, these are my drawings and my They're so illustrations. intricate, the drawings. Yeah, they, they are a little bit like the writing of the Psycho in Seven, <laughs> I think. Is it in Spanish or English? Both. This. Uh, and what determines what language it's in? I think in both languages. Oh, you do? Yeah, or, or not at all. <laughs> Depends on who you ask. <laughs> but these are, these are some of the... This was an early incarnation of the Pale Man. So in a way, is this a diary for you? Yeah, except I don't write on it daily. Mm. You know, that's a tree, the mandrake root. You know, uh, I write. I write occasionally. It's been a while uh, because uh, the more I the more I work with great artists, the more I'm kind of shamed to draw myself. So I doodle. So how many of those books have you filled? There are about three hundred pages of notes uh, that I have except about 90 pages of notes are lost because uh, the, the notebook of Kronos I gave to Jim Cameron in a drunken stupor in 1992 or okay. 93, and uh, he seems to have misplaced it. <laughs> so you're in this great moment right now where you have a three DVD Blu-ray pack of three of your best films yes. coming out. Uh, the first one is Kronos, chronologically. Yeah. Yeah. Where did the idea for that spring from? Kronos came from a, a, a bunch of things, growing up Catholic in Mexico, which is a pretty gory affair, and with the idea of uh, vampirism as both a sacrament and, a, and an addiction, you know, and, and, and I tried to reinvent vampirism through alchemy, and uh, that, all those elements, the fact that in the 1970s women were wearing what was called living jewelry, which were scarabs, with a fastened to a golden chain, and they used to crawl in their chests. Pretty, pretty kinky. Is it for me? What did Cronus achieve for you? Well, that movie changed my life because we were more than The Underdog, more than The Dark Horse. We were a movie that nobody wanted to produce. Nobody was supporting except my producers in Mexico. And we suddenly were selected for Cannes. And, and literally, we were all of a sudden one of the most awarded movies in, in Mexican uh, film history. I remember the first time Kronos won the first award, which was a cash award. And before that award, we were in debt for half a million. I won, we won the award and literally, like, like a beauty contest, I was crying, mm. crying in the stage, holding this giant check. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was trembling and I was really moved because A, I was happy the movie was being recognized and B, I was not going to jail. When you think about Devil's Backbone, is it related to Kronos in a way, are these, films uh, of the same ilk? That's a very good question. I think that Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and Kronos, both, all of them, deal both with what it is to be a kid and, and, and facing uh, horror in different forms. 
political, personal, um, familiar, you know, uh, social, blah, blah, blah. And, and each of the movies shows one side of the way kids interact with the fantastic, which is a very different way than adults do with the fantastic. What is your recollection of the night of the Academy Awards, the year of Pan's Labyrinth, where it surprised everybody by winning three of the six categories it was nominated for. Your name was being thrown around that auditorium like nobody else's that night. I had a blast. I mean, I've never done a movie to win an Oscar or be nominated or to make a box office hit. I always just make the movies I want to make for the reasons I want to make them. So it was quite a surprise. I remember my shoes were super tight. Because I have the Fred Flintstone feet. Yeah, I can tell you have wide feet. <laughs> Horrible. They are like uh, paninis, human paninis. You know, they are <laughs> super wide and flat. And 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 uh, I remember that the moment the Academy Awards were over, I was super happy for everybody that won from my team, and I was just waiting to remove the shoes. When you think back to Hellboy, how did you deal with the extra input of production executives? You know, other than Mimic, my studio experiences have been really good creatively. Blade 2, uh, everybody was at New Line, everybody was watching Lord of the Rings being made, so we were left alone by default. You know, compared to Lord of the Rings, we were like chum chain. Nobody you know? cared about you. Nobody cared. They were, they were all watching over there. So we, I remember we showed the movie to Bob Shea, and Bob Shea said it, it's vile, it's violent, it's disgusting, it's repulsive. But if that's the movie you want to release, that's the movie we will release it. And, and, and we did a few changes after the audience screening, but it pretty much went intact. You started as a special effects makeup artist. Yeah. You seem to be someone who prefers handmade effects over CGI for the most part. Whenever possible. Whenever possible, I think a physical effect, a physical thing to respond to is better than going digital. I'm, I don't hate digital. I love it. I use it a lot. But you gotta use it as the last resort. You don't use it as lazy filmmaking tools that allow you to, it's the worst um, iteration of we'll fix it in post if you do it in a lazy way. But if you do it with a creative mind and knowing that's the only tool that will do it, you, it's perfectly legitimate. At this point today, for better or worse, you're as known for the movie you didn't do, The Hobbit, as the ones that you did. Yeah. How hard was it to walk away from that film after working on it in pre-production for so long? It doesn't get harder than, than that. I mean, it's the hardest decision I've ever taken. I have incredible heartache. I feel uh, terrible about it. It's very hard. It's getting a little easier to talk about it, but essentially it's like you've been recently widowed and everybody asking you, uh, exactly how your wife died. It's pretty morbid. And what helped you make that decision? There was no other choice. Mm. I mean, I kept postponing, I kept fending off the problems, I kept compartmentalizing, I kept, we did everything we could. Do you think once the film gets made that you'll be able to watch it? Oh yeah, I, I, I'll be able to watch it and, and, and probably enjoy it. But you know, with The Hobbit, I feel like the guy in this, uh, in the in the real life experience that uh, Danny Boyle just did his movie is I was hanging by a thread of my arm for so long that at the end of the day, you have to cut it off. And you know, do I like having one arm less? No, but did I have to? Yes. So what is next on your plate? We are trying as hard as we can to get uh, at the Mountains of Madness, produced based on the H.P. Lovecraft uh, book. It's being produced by Jim Cameron. It's a huge adventure, thriller, a movie I've been trying to do uh, actively for uh, 13 years. Uh, and in my mind, since I was 11 or 12. I love a B or Z movie horror movie that most people would forget called The Car with James Brolin. And I love it to the point where I'm having the car from that movie handmade in steel uh, right now. So that's gonna be my car in LA for every day. I always cry at the end of City Life. 
I love the peripathetic nature of Chaplin's stuff. He combines the tragedy and the comedy in a unique way and City Lights, when the, when the girl finally realizes who he is, I always cry. I'm not a huge fan of uh, uh, Todd Browning's Dracula. I hope you will find this comfortable. Thanks, it looks very inviting. Ouch. I love Todd Browning, but I never fell in love with Lugosi. I love Lugosi when he plays wilder parts, you know, like uh, uh, when he plays against Karloff. But him alone, I was never a big fan of. Oh, it's nothing serious, just a small cut from that paper clip. Can I name a few? Uh, Eyes Without a Face, Dior and the Beast by Cocteau, Touch of Evil by Orson Welles, Seven Chances by Buster Keaton, Greed by Von Strohan, and keep going. I think the most influential working filmmaker today is sadly not working enough, which is Terry Gilliam. I think Brazil really came in and almost gave birth to an aesthetic, including Junot and Carole and many other European filmmakers that latched onto his aesthetic. Mm -hmm.